Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is One Day Today. Welcome to episode 139. So glad to have you with us. I am excited to have our guest, Lisa, with us today, and you'll you'll meet her in a moment. But first off, just want to say hello and, you know, remind you all and myself why we're here. You know, what, like, what is one day? What is, what is this stage about? And, you know, and I think we'll all start answering that with an inquiry of, you know, like with, a, with this ever expanding complex world of all people of every faith, denomination, politics, color, creed, gender, you know, what, you know, what is it that I have uniquely that can impact all these people on this planet? What, and not only that, what, you know, what power do I have with all the, the old conversations that, you know, we're told that these, some people can't get along. And we say this a lot on the stages, you know, Jews, some people say that all these old, these old generational conversations that Jews and Palestinians will never get along. Pakistanis and Indians will, will always be, you know, always be enemies. You know, Catholics and Protestants will always, will never see eye to eye, Democrats, Republicans, you know, and fill that, fill in the gap with, you know, any, any you know, any group that, we, we say these stories about, but I would assert that, you know, no matter who you are, where you're from, you know, you have something unique, something powerful, something beautiful in the, who you are and what you, what you say and what you do and what you create right now that could really impact, enliven, uplift, empower anybody on this planet, whether they're your friends, your family, a stranger, someone you love, someone you never even met, someone you don't even like or don't agree with or don't understand you and I have a choice and a, and a, really the power right now and and right now and right now to plant seeds of love to plant seeds of laughter and beauty wonder to lift up the people that you know society says are, are different and and I would say that you know when we really stand in who we truly are and not the stories about who we are we can, the truth is we can do anything. We can we can do things beyond what which we can even see right now, and you know, and the the peripheral view of what the, the the conversation of humanity, and that's what this is. It's a conversation that you know you know this is a spotlight of amazing leaders, you know, creative leaders, creative leaders, and spiritual leaders, and community leaders, people who are up to something bigger than themselves, you know, and time and time again, every guest we've had is someone who's up to something big, something bigger than themselves. And how they got there was more times than not overcoming something that was scary, was challenging, was was horrifying in some cases. And and this is something that Matthew says, and I'll, and I'll bring Matthew in as well, but we, we say here that on the other side of trauma lies wisdom. And that's what the space is for, is to share that unique wisdom of leaders all over the world. Well, I'm gonna, let's bring Matthew in here and we'll, we'll continue with introducing Lisa, but please welcome our co-host, Matthew. Oh, there I am. Ah, sorry, like, the button wouldn't hit him, it. I don't see him. Yeah, the button wouldn't press at first for some reason. Oh man, yeah. It's it's funny that theme like we've had that theme on the show for almost a year and a half now on the other side of trauma lies wisdom and the only thing I like to add to it is occasionally is for those who choose to look for it and for the you know because there can be trauma but unless you actually choose to actively reframe it and try to learn something from it then most of the time we just stew in the the suffering like we just suffer we just live with the trauma and never move beyond it um, it is such a choice and it is like it is like everything is that <laughs> yeah that like everything is a choice everything is a choice including what we think what we believe what we say what we do what we choose to to be in this world all of that it's all a choice and like something that i like I don't actually I don't know if I've ever even said this on the stage before, but it's it's something I've held for a long time. Um, I do not know if it is possible to be born into this world and not be indoctrinated in some way. And what that points to for me is 
to be born here is to be told stories about what this world is and how we're supposed to be in this world and what we need to do to be liked, to be accepted, to be loved. Yeah. And when I've examined those stories, yeah, like none of them are really true. Like none of those stories are true as far as I can tell. Like every single one that I've really taken the time to stop and look at in my own self, in my own experience, there's no truth to it. And so that brings us back to choice because if we can choose to see these stories and we can choose not to live as if those stories are true, then all of a sudden, what possibility does that open up for us? If we are no longer beholden to the obligations of society, of our parents, of whatever, and we can actually do what what feels good for us and what feels loving for us, and that's the key word to me, it's like, does it actually feel loving? Mm. Then all of a sudden, what possibilities are open? Like, what can you imagine doing if you have no inhibitions that would really right. radically change the world in a loving way? Right. It's like the, the toxicities or the, the old conversations of the past are really what limit, <laughs> yes. limit our future that we can't see because what's ha- all those traumas are what blind us. I mean, it's, it's like you're saying, it's a choice. It's like it's, it's a lot more comfortable not to look at all the things that the scars and the, and the suffering and what's caused that and how I what, what my part was in that in holding on to that suffering and holding on to you know, the fear and based on surviving and being enough, like all like all that indoctrination of being enough, being, you know, being successful, being, you know, being liked, being, you know, what, what we're told to be versus who we can choose to be from that blank slate, that blank canvas of who I say I am as human and who you say you are as human and what we, how we're, when we live in knowing we rise together and we can love someone that we've never met and we can love someone that we're best friends with all the same. Yeah. Cause in letting go of the stories and all of a sudden we have this possibility to actually see the person and not the stories we have about that person. And that's a totally right. different experience. It really is totally different and experience. And we get to say it's our choice. We get to, so we get to create and that's really what this is about is holding that space for what what if we did create from a blank canvas for humanity you know what new art and collaborations and you know scientific discoveries spiritual collaborations and music and food and you know things i can't even imagine you know that's what excites me is you know when we when we see each other and hold space for each other even when we don't always see eye to eye so, I think it's- and so that's a really long-winded stay- way of saying this is what we're here for. <laughs> this is what we're inviting. Yeah. Is that level of collaboration? Yeah. And I and honestly, with that, like I feel like it's time to to bring Lisa on and just let her dive into either this or maybe something else. We'll find out. Please welcome to the stage, everybody, Lisa Williams. Hey guys. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome. Oh my goodness. I you start I kind of started to get a little teary eyed when you were talking there. Hmm. Yeah. What stood out to you? Yeah, what was there for you? Well, the first thing that came to mind was how how two parties are supposed to be at war, you know, forever. And I the first thought I had was my my choice to be really good friends with my ex husband. And hmm. And even though he had an affair with one of my best friends and broke my heart, you know, we had these two little boys that were three months old and three years old, and we were going to be with them for the rest of their lives. And we had choices to make about whether we were going to be friends and do it together, or we were going to, I, I just... I've seen so many stories where it's it's a different path, you know, and we ended up having this crazy blended family and still do, you know. Wow. I am um, what also resonated with me was what you said, Matthew, about being in this world and being indoctrinated. 
And holy cow, I personally don't remember a time in my life that I didn't know Jesus, like the name of Jesus in my life. But I definitely remember moments when he became like my personal friend, you know, and, and I, and the idea that I, I was his best idea, like literally like Matthew, you are his best idea, Abram, you know, and whatever lens you look at life through, I mean, I'm a Jesus lover, but whether it's another God or, or nature or community, I mean, I hope and pray that people have this belief in a higher power that has a, a prosperous life, one that we're meant to do this, you know, communicate and collaborate and and lock arms together. I love just the idea that you guys started this in COVID when so many other people were hiding under their blankets and glued to the news, which is just constant negativity. And you guys came out here and are doing this beautiful movement of connection. It just, it lights me up to be part of it. Thank you for allowing me to have the blessing of being part of your stage. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing. And it's, it's, uh, makes me, you know, it inspires me just, just your presence already, just sharing that story, you know, how you've chosen, you know, out of love, you know, out of a, a difficult situation with your, you know, with your ex-husband to be able to create out of love for your, your, having this family that, you know, didn't have to go that way. You had that choice. And it's, it's, I guess I, for me, it's just case in point, what you just, what you, what you experienced and overcame and who how you sharing about it is just giving me the chills. Like, like, cause it's, it took something, it took a choice for you to be that and to, to be that for your kids, for yourself and for, and everybody's better off for well, you can being I, that. I'll tell you, there was a moment, um, I vividly remember it. I was literally kneeling in my, in my closet and my kids were on the other side of the door and, and they were asking me, you know, they were, mama, can I come in? And I just remember like, sorry, this, I still gets me emotional. I just remember like being so pissed at God, just like I've been your good and faithful servant, you know? And it was, I had just found out that, um, my ex was, he was getting married to my friend. And I was like, well, shit, I'm really gonna have to actually accept this now, you know? Like, this is gonna be in my life. And I remember raging, but also just like pleading with my heavenly father, like, okay, you get to release this burden from me if we're gonna do this, you know? I am telling you guys, I, I haven't witnessed like physical miracles in my life. But I had a miracle in my life because I was so blessed with forgiveness. And, and I can't even describe what's possible for families. You know, you loved each other once, right? You, you made these children together. And there's, there's, love is still there. It's just putting aside all the, the, the garbage that we all have, that we, we all bring with us from our own families of heritage and, you know, what have you, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And it's, you know, it's, I feel like it gets to be a part of my story, but it also gets to, I, I give the glory to God because I really don't think typical humans without asking for that gift. And, and then, like you said, Matthew, not only, you know, you have to seek it, but then you have to accept it also, right? In your life. And I mean, there's a lot of stories in my life like that, but that's, that's the one that really came to mind when you were talking about two people that were not supposed to be friends. You know what I mean? Like society yeah. tells you, you're not supposed to be best friends with your ex and his wife. Right. 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 And yet here you are. Right. Uh, I mean, there's so many levels to that. And the, for me, like the key word that you just shared is the forgiveness and you know how, how forgiveness is such a it's like this is there's so many stories of that that has the same essence of what what you've been talking about and what we're sharing about is you know it's i mean a lot of time 
somebody did us wrong or we view God did us wrong, you know, or God, God or something, something happened that we're upset and we're, 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 we are at the impact of circumstance that everything we thought we knew was stable is not anymore. And for, it's like forgiveness is such a, a gift to ourselves. You know, you, you had every reason in your mind not to forgive. And yet you chose out of love to, to give that gift to yourself, but also to, to your ex, to your, to your family, to your kids. And it's like, that's, and I feel like forgiveness is, is something that sometimes we want to hold on to something that is trying and challenging. And, but when you're sharing about your prayer, like how you felt like you wanted to just let go of that burden and how you, how God allowed you to do that. And in that you found forgiveness and gave yourself peace and your family ultimately. And that's, yeah. that's really what I hear. It's like you, you had the courage to forgive and we're, we are all better off for it on a cosmic level, really, because you, you put that in the world. Yeah, I actually, I, I want to ask you a question about that. There's something, cause that, that moment just feels so powerful to me. Like, was there when when you were in that moment and you were in that space was there an understanding that came or uh, a realization of that, that really helped you to make this choice and made it not just bearable but now fun and beautiful and loving yeah absolutely my mom i was raised by this woman that was um and my dad daddy was daddy's always been in the picture but my mom was my best friend, you know, and she loved, she loved Jesus so much. And she was a walking testimony of his love. And she was also a lifelong learner. And anytime anything would happen in our lives, she, she would always, you know, tell us or, or remind us to be looking for what God's going to do with it. Right. And, um, so I remember, and my parents had been separated when I was like nine. And I had this example, unlike a lot of my friends who their parents divorced, my parents actually got back together. And it, and it was because of a lot of work that they did together. So I had this model thinking, okay, no worries. I, I've got this, you know, I can do this really, you know. And when the plan didn't come to fruition like that, I remember thinking, okay, Lord, then you have something better for me. I know you do. And um, I ended up, you know, I ended up marrying a very, very, one of my best friends that I'd worked with, you know, for five years at the time. I, I tease, you know, I had to switch husbands to get my girl. I have this beautiful daughter that is just turned 15 that it's, it is, it is because there's a, there's a bigger plan for my life and it's a better one. Right. Um, you, you were saying something also about when you talk about forgiveness, I think the first person I had to forgive was myself because I had such, I had just a big as part to play in the breakdown of our marriage as my ex did. Right. It, it was, Maybe mine wasn't as out there or, you know, um, maybe as taboo, let's say, but I had just as much a part of that as he did. Right. And so that was a big part of it also was forgiveness of myself, my part that I had to play. That's yeah. I don't know many who are willing and able to take ownership of that, of anything like that in that way. And I like, I I love, I love that you're just here doing it so publicly because it's such a beautiful example of how easy it can be once we actually accept that we're not perfect and we do make mistakes and we do cause a lot of these things in our life in some way. It's like it, we may not be solely responsible. It takes two to tango, but like we do have a part in it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, and sharing. Oh. Still there? My phone keeps going off. <laughs> sharing these, sharing these things haven't always been 
what I, 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 I did not talk about this for many, many years until I stepped into this world of entrepreneurship. And I, I started hearing like, you have a story and your story can help others. And you should tell that story. And, like, all the things that you hear about. Yeah. <laughs> all the things that we invite here on the stage. Right, right. Well, yeah. Well, I think that's what you just said there is kind of, that's the formula of, you know, I mean, there is a paradigm shift that we're experiencing uh, in my, in my experience and in my opinion in humanity, where more and more people are, are, are realizing that, you know, and that's how this movement began was, you know, discovering I share my story and it can help others who are dealing with what I was, when I was looking off the top of down to this valley on the top of the mountain about to fall free fall, or maybe it's a surprise, but it's like, it's always, that's the space that growth comes. That's the space that becoming an entrepreneur, like how those life lessons in that journey have led you to create a life that not only are you thriving, but you can give that that gift to others because you experienced it. Yeah. If I hadn't, you know, I was at my, my corporate executive role for almost 30 years. And in that, in that final couple of years, I mean, did you ever stay at a, at a job way longer than you should have, like five years yep. longer? And I, I was definitely at my, I had 19 bosses in 23 years at my last firm. And every one of them had another agenda. And I remember this last one was such a doozy. He was like, you know, half my age and, and tried, you know, I, it was just comical what was happening. And I was a headhunter. So I was, I was in the job of matchmaking and helping people find new careers. And here I was constantly being, you know, these people coming to me, like they wanted a new job, but I really felt like they were actually wanting to be something new, you know, and, and yet so many people are, are on this roller coaster of life and they maybe they have these golden handcuffs also like I did and I didn't I couldn't remember guys the last time I had learned something new and and I remember thinking there's God like Lord you there is there is definitely more that I'm supposed to be doing with this life you know and it was it was actually I kind of the the culmination of that those 19 bosses and the last one, kind of a crappy one, you know, put me on a plan, said, said my clients thought I was too transactional and gave half the accounts to someone, you know, 30, 30 years old with a really short skirt, you know, and, and at the same time, my, my mom got sick, my best friend. And, um, I ended up taking a leave of absence to care for her. And it was, the biggest gift of my life being able to be there for her during her last 10 months and and having that privilege you know had i not stepped out of that corporate world and done that i i would have i i would have lost out on the biggest gift of my life which was caring for my mom and during that same time, my best friend was also sick and, the, and they were gone, guys, both of them in the span of 10 months. And bam, it was like I had this hole in my heart for these two women. And yet, God, again, it was almost like he, 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 he went before me and he had planted these other seeds of people like yourselves that I became part of different organizations and started my own business and the the people in these this new world it was it's like one by one they're kind of filling these this mama size hole in my heart and this best friend size hole you know and i feel like there's a lot of people out there right now that are that have these holes in their heart and yet there's such an abundant world of people that we can, we get to be friends with. I can't wait to force you guys to be my friends for life. Like we're going to be friends. Just so you know. No force, no <laughs> force needed. That, well, I just want to touch on a few, a couple of like, it's so powerful, everything you're saying, you know, and how you've, well, 
first of all, when you said, I, I love the analogy of how you said the golden handcuffs. I wanted you to go into more of that because I love that because in my mind, what that means is, you know, it's a life that we think it's like they're golden. They're really cool. They're really nice and they're, they're valuable and they're worth a lot, but you're still in a prison. You're still trapped. Yeah. You know, it's, you're like successful or successful and maybe a, a, in a corporate ladder, but like, to me, that's like how people who are living their lives, but not fulfilled having, like you're saying holes in their heart. And like, what do you, you know, what do you say? Cause I, it sounds like you had this beautiful experience and transformation of these, you know, this lo of, of loss and of, you know, being unfulfilled and asking bigger questions of what am I doing here and giving that to God. But like, what, like, how did, like, what do you say to someone who's, who has those golden handcuffs on who are maybe still feel trapped? Yeah. I say, first of all, just, just acknowledge it. That's the first thing to realize and, and ask yourself, I mean, whoever took that class, what am I supposed to be when I grow up? No, nobody ever took that class. We all, we so many of us, we, we should take that class. Absolutely. <laughs> But I mean, I was like most people, I was told, go to school, get a good job. You know, your life will be great. And, and it was for a long time. I was blessed. I really loved what I did for, for a very long time. But I find a lot of people, you know, I, I worked in technology and financial services. And that was some of the, theoretically, some of the highest paid industries in the world. But guess what? Most of those people quite frankly, are only there for one of two reasons. One, because their mom or dad did it. Or two, they literally Googled like best paying jobs. It wasn't because that's what they're supposed to do. It wasn't because that's their calling. It wasn't because that's like, I, I you know, what I get to do now is I've, I'm stepping into my God gifted greatness. Like literally what God's been preparing me for my whole life. And every one of us has that opportunity. It's just a matter of saying yes. I mean, what I what did I do? I literally just started saying yes to things. You know, sure I'll go I sure I'll go check out your network marketing company. I didn't even know what network marketing was. You know, sure I'll go check out your franchise. Sure I'd like to you know, be a guest on your podcast. I had no clue what I was doing, you know? But I started saying yes instead of, well, no, I don't have time. You know what I mean? Like, what else are we going to do? We only have this one life, right? Right. I really hear, like, it's like that childlike curiosity and wonder, that, that curiosity, you know, that, yeah. like, something that is so contrary to what society my what i what i hear and see from society is you have to be grown up you can't it's like you're it sounds like you're playing with with life and so i'm having a lot of fun i just turned 52 and i'm more excited about life than i've ever been and you know one of the biggest things guys <laughs> was um i i realized like if i was bringing home all these complaints this is all my kids were hearing in at a certain period of time. How jazzed could they be about going out into this big, big world? Like that just sounds horrible. You know I, mean? I my uh, my middle son. He's a really fabulous drummer, and he's nineteen. And he, when he graduated from high school, you know, he went to community college. He didn't know what he wanted to do. And I remember after his first semester, he came to me and he's like, mama, I just, I don't, I just don't really know why I'm there. I, I really don't like it. And I remember thinking five years ago when I was still in my corporate, you know, thing, I would have been freaking out right now, but I am thrilled for him. I, you know, he's pursuing his music. He's doing all the things that you're supposed to do as a 19 year old. And I'm really excited that he's he's becoming a student of entrepreneurship too, a student of the cash flow quadrant and rich dad poor dad and, and you know a student of how money works. That's what I teach. I teach people how money works and um, the things that we should be taught in school that we don't get taught. You know, the things that would be very useful to learn in school in the society at the very least. 
right? Like it, and and here's the thing, like, so th I, there's actually three things I want to pull out of like everything you just said, um, starting with this one, which is um, something I've discovered later in life is that there's actually two curriculums that get taught in the U.S. There's the curriculum that gets taught in the private schools, the really expensive schools, which does teach money and economics and how to actually grow wealth and all, and all that fun stuff. And then there's the curriculum that gets taught in the public schools, which does not. And like, I don't know if that's by accident or design or both, but like that is something that is happening. And I've, I've observed it across the board. Like any anyone who grew up with a lot of money, they know how to work with money. Anyone who didn't doesn't. And the thing is, right now, the way things work is it's more expensive to be poor than it is to be rich because like the services that you need when you don't have a lot of money are more expensive and you're having to use them more often. You're not able to buy new things. You're having to buy used things, which cost more to maintain and to repair. And it's just it's this whole backward system. Um, and like this is just something that I, I like I don't have any real answers to. Like this is something I bring in the conversation because it's through conversation that I feel like we can find the answers. I have an, uh, I have an answer to it. Shoot. It's called financial education <laughs> across the board. And I, and I also mean like, imagine when's the last time the financial indus industry was revolutionized. It's yeah. one of the oldest, most archaic, I recruited in that industry for 30 years, friends. It is like when you think of when you think of a financial advisor, you know, the first image that pops in my head, you know, is an old white guy behind a mahogany desk that is mansplaining something to me. You know what I mean? And yes. but I I know more than 99% of advisors out there because I'm an educator, you know, and yet that industry hasn't changed in in hundreds of years, right? So imagine if actually every human just decided to be a student of their own money and actually get get knowledgeable about it. It's and, and you know what? The banks and the financial institutions, they, they it actually benefits them greatly to keep us dumb. Yes. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. There's, a, there's an awesome book I'd recommend by one of my business partners. It's called How Many Works Don't Be a Sucker. And um, it's the it's just such a great rudimentary start for people that are kind of starting down that path. Um, I have so many books that I recommend. <laughs> one is the Power of Zero, which is how to retire tax free. Mm -hmm. That was a lean in moment for me as a you know, you talk about those golden handcuffs. You want it. You want to get a, a corporate executive like me excited. Abram, you tell them about how much they can save in taxes by starting their own business. Because mm -hmm. as a highly paid corporate executive, I was paying the highest taxes of anyone on the planet. You know what I mean? Right. And what I've learned now about business ownership and entity creations and, and tax strategy, I mean, it gets me excited, you know, and, and I love I like, love to help other people get excited about it because no one cares about our money more than we do. And imagine how much more generous we can be. You know, we have a goal in our company. We're creating a tribe of seven figure givers because we're learning how to generate more in our lives so that we can be more generous. Here, here. I, awesome. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, so that could be an entire show on its own, and I, yeah. I, I feel like we need to have you back so we can have that show. Let's do it. Uh, so, okay, yes, let's absolutely. I'm committing to that. Um, and there's two other things I want to tease out before they get lost because like the, the you you brought up a whole a lot a lot and all of it's really important, um, at least to me. And I feel like. It, hopefully this will translate to everyone else as well um so the other thing you brought up um oh, what was it? it was just on the tip of my tongue oh the reason people have their jobs the reason people choose their jobs so i was actually just having this conversation with uh, my partner last night like we're, we're working on creating something that is for corporate leaders for executives for ceos and teaches the, and this is a part of what we'll be teaching but there's a much broader curriculum and she's from Germany. Like, so when she was talking about work, she, like, because I, 
I brought up the importance of having a vision and being aligned, like the vision that you have being aligned with the vision of the company you're working with. And is that vision meaningful to you? And if so, then that makes working with that company so much more beautiful and fulfilling because you're actually creating something that feels meaningful. And she was instantly like, yeah, like, doesn't everyone do that? I was like, what are you talking about? Like here in the U S like the first thing you ask when you ask someone, or the first thing answer you get when you ask someone why they're working, where they're working is because benefits or money, like it has yeah. nothing to do with vision. And she's like, no, in Germany, that's, that's everything. Like, like if, if like, that's the first thing we want to know about the company is what are they doing? And that just, that blew my mind that like, I didn't realize there was a Western society out there that actually had that built into their knowledge whatsoever. And then she said something that really got to me. She said, maybe that's why Germans are so much better workers. Mm. I was like, yeah, that's like, that's yes, that absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so the, that I just wanted to point out really fast, but then my big question for you, and honestly, this might be just like time to give you time to talk um that step into your own business your own life and actually creating the life you want like you mentioned a couple of things that led to that the bad boss and a few other things but like i'd love to give you just space to like just just share some of the biggest moments in that journey and what was like two things two things that stand out what was stopping you from realizing that before if if that's even a, a valid question for this and how did your life change with the realizations so like like really if you can go into the experience yeah yeah absolutely well i i'll, I'll say first of all that the world of entrepreneurship never even really occurred to me it it wasn't something i wasn't raised in a in a household that had business owners i was i was a good student i did what i was supposed to do you know and i remember really being blessed because i accidentally landed in the role of recruiter headhunter you know whatever you want to call it like most people when you ask most people how did they choose what they're doing so oftentimes it's by accident and that was me. I just happened to really love what I did for a really long time. My superpower is I, I have a genuine just interest in people. And so matching them to jobs just made sense, right? We had periods of time in our business where we had massive highs and then it would go really low. And I was 100% commissioned my whole career. I, I actually that was a gift that i was given i didn't even realize it the fact that i never really had a a cap on my income and it was up to me in a lot of ways however in that 23 years at my last firm i my income was cut in half three times i had already told you about my 19 bosses and it was so interesting how it really was not until i had this level of dissatisfaction that was so acute that, and, and my best friend getting sick, I will say. When Elizabeth got sick, it really made me start to think about my life as the bigger picture. And, and especially the people that I was serving, they seemed to be coming to me and just really wanting to be something new. And it made me start to think, am I supposed to be something new? And I remember interviewing people. I'm an, I'm an interviewer by trade. So I, I interviewed coaches. I interviewed some pastors. I interviewed some um, psychologists. I'm a psych major. And I remember realizing not a lot of them are making very much money. And I am used to making, I mean, I was on average three to 500,000 a year. And I, I don't say that to brag. I say that because it's an awesome industry to get into. And if you're good at it, you, you do very well. If you place people that are high level positions, you do very, very well for yourself. And yet the, the crazy thing is money was never the driver for me. It just kind of followed, right? 
However, when I when I look back now and I remember when Elizabeth got sick and I thought, okay, Lord, is there something else that I'm supposed to be doing? I, I'm not having as much fun as I once had. I, I feel like the people that I'm working with, they really, they're not having as much fun. What else is there? And I, I was very, very dissatisfied. And I think that's, that's actually the number one indicator when somebody gets dissatisfied enough they're just up to their eyebrows. They're just, they're done, right? And the right person in the at the right time, it, it he could have said anything to me, but it was about a business position opportunity. And at the time, I'd never even considered being a business owner. But I was so dissatisfied that I said, okay, yeah, I would love to learn more about it. And I had been a, um, a student of Dave Ramsey for you Financial Peace University uh, fans when I was a single mom. This was like 19 years ago. And I'd already been a student of money. I really was curious. I was a savvy investor. Um, I, I accumulated a lot. I was blessed to do that. I was a good saver and I was good at investing. But I remember learning about other ways to invest. And I went to my two advisors that I worked with and I asked, and I was, I said, I want to, I want to learn how to do that. Right. And they told me, you know, they kind of mansplained me a little bit, like Lisa, you're, you're doing good. Just keep with what we're doing. Right. And I'm so irritated with myself. This was back after the 2008 crash. I lost like 300 grand, just like that, like everybody else did, you know, and I was seeking something else. So when this when this business came into my world, it's a business of financial education, wealth education, teaching families to actually own their power with money and not be a victim to the next financial crash. You know, fast forward to now, our students, we have not lost a dime in this last market recession. We've only we've only done better with our money. We've diversified our assets and we're 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 doing it ourselves because we are all the best stewards of our money if we make a choice to. I remember um, stepping into this role of of business ownership and thinking, I guess I get to wear lots of hats, but I also get to lock arms with people that are way smarter than me. And so the people that may be curious about what else is there out there besides the corporate world, I would really say just there is so many unlimited opportunities out there. And just start saying yes to things. And yes, there's so much free content. It's not like, you know, you don't have to go get an MBA. I, I can't tell you the number of people that would come to me looking for their next opportunity because they've been passed up by a promotion in their corporate gig and they've gone to now mba school gone 100k in debt and they still don't get this promotion and i i would just love to encourage people take that portion of that money that you might put towards a certified education i guess in the curriculum of universities and actually invest it into yourself because I'll tell you what, I just, I can't, I will never look back. I'm so thrilled at this world that I've stepped into accidentally. And I, I, I feel like I'm part of the Great Commission. It's kind of a dual Great Commission because my favorite thing is to bring people to the love of Jesus. I also now get to bring people to the love of entrepreneurship, which I wish someone had tapped me on the shoulder earlier in my life, um, but I'm so thankful that they did now. So guys, you um, you let me know. I know we're kind of limited on time. I wanna be respectful of your time as well. Thank you for sharing, Lisa. It's, uh, I love how you ended it. It's like, it was just an, it, like by accident. And I think that's the most beautiful thing is like the life of our dreams is not necessarily what we're, pinpoint focused on with a telescope. I mean, we can, it's good to have goals and plans and the vision, but in my experience, the most impactful, beautiful, amazing things in life are the things that happen between my plans, things I don't expect, things on a road I didn't expect to be going down. And it's, uh, but it's, it's amazing that go, being on the other side of your journey, being in a place now where you're the most, in, you know, the most fulfilled and 
living your life and, and, and emphasize your life. Like you have created something that inspires you every day and that you can empower others with that. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's inspiring that you're, uh, it just, your presence is just, it's, you, you just have this warm, loving, giving energy. And I, I don't think that's a coincidence at all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so a question comes, um, because you mentioned earlier, you're creating this group, um, Earn More to Give More. Did that come, like, where in this, in this journey did that idea come and um how has the earnings changed since you adopted that vision like have, like has it actually like really grown since you've adopted that vision or like what's happened yeah absolutely it's it so it no it didn't come straight away um it came probably about two years into our into our business building journey and and since that since that idea it's it's exploded and it and it's it's i think a lot of it's because people realize that we are so much better when we can give and and you know maybe it's our time maybe like you guys this this beautiful blessing of this there goes my dog didn't they tell you my husband was supposed he let him inside i'm sorry guys <laughs> He's going to keep going because that's got a lot what... to say. That's all right. <laughs> it's okay. No worries. We don't, we don't really play the professionalism game here. So it's like, okay. you're, you're good. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's funny, you know, in my world, um, I find that a lot of believers have a very, very poor money story. It's almost like um, poverty is next to, to press to spirituality in some ways, you know, and yet I know that I'm, I'm God's best idea and he doesn't love me any less than, you know, Mr. Joe, you know, billionaire. Right. And so if that's possible for someone, it's possible for me. And the more that, you know, money is certainly it money makes bad people bad, but I think money makes good people even better. Right. And imagine, I think more money needs to be in, in the hands of good people doing good things. And I believe it starts with getting smart about money. Yeah, there's, I mean, I, I feel like we could talk about this on, uh, for a while, but like the conversations we have about money are, I, I just remember I was at a job not too, not too long ago, a month or two ago. And I remember like, there's a lot of conversations of like, of like resentment towards money or towards rich people, towards people who have money. And I, I mean, and I think it's easy to sympathize with that argument. It's like, yeah, they have a lot of money and they're not giving it to this and they're, they could be curing world hunger. And it's, it's like demonization of money is kind of avoiding actually acknowledging the resource money is and how money is a blessing. Or it is a resource that allows us to bless people if that's what we're committed to. You know, we can, yeah. you know, it's like, I want to make a lot of money and be wealthy so I can do stuff that impacts people and that I can live a life that inspires and fulfills me, but also everyone around me and people I don't know even. So it's like, there's, there's so much in our conversations with money that disempower us that we, you know, you know, money's bad and it's evil. And there's, there's all these sayings about. Doesn't you know, grow on trees. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's so many things. sayings like that. Yeah. yeah. Also, the the um, it is harder for a rich man to enter that kingdom of heaven. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, um, and it's not just Christianity either. I've noticed this in it's in it's in a lot of like less so in in the roots of the spiritual practice behind the religion, but more in the religious practices. Yeah. Um, so like once it there's something that happened in a lot of them that once it transitioned from like an actual spiritual practice and and something that was used to um, really learn yourself and God at the same time, like to, to, to connect to both into the dogmatic modern religions that we have today, that snuck in there somewhere, it seems. 
Yeah. But this idea that like money is evil, that like to be to to actually obtain spiritual enlightenment, you have to be poor. You have to abandon everything. Like it's right. It's a big thing. Well, and think about just the concept of, um, you know, Mother Teresa had millions and millions of dollars go between her hands. Mm. You know, she was the go between, and and. She, but she was entrusted with that, you know, because of what she was doing. It, whatever you do with the money that you have, that's up to you, obviously. And there's there's so many stories of good people doing things with with money, right? Unfortunately, there's far too many stories of, you know. By the way, I don't believe that the, the modern day of way we have all these religious sects is the way Jesus meant to, for the church to be built. You know, the church was meant to the people to go to the people, not for the people to go to church. You know? Personally, that's, that's my belief system, but that's a whole nother episode. For day, right. Well, yeah. We got a lot of episodes. Are true. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's absolutely true is, you know, it's become about seats in the, like, and it's not all this, but I, I, there's a lot of tribalism about, you know, seat, getting seats in the pews rather than a personal connection to God. You know, yeah. it's like, that's really, it's funny. I, I, I talked to a friend the other day and like some people, like she was kind of venting about, you know, dealing with toxically, you know, angry tribal religion and you know dealing with dealing with some people who are christian but making people wrong and then but we we're like talking about it and a lot of people will use the bible as as a brick to throw people and a lot of people will use it as a way to love their neighbor and you know and i think there's so many lessons in, in it and i think what to what you're saying is like it's about a personal connection you know in our own experience not about how many millions of people we can get to agree with us yeah yeah absolutely 100 percent. so you you're up to some amazing stuff lisa and i'm really you know well i want to i want to kind of as we as we conclude i want to you know so I, this is a question we used to ask um i guess maybe you year I, I, we haven't asked for a while but i felt called to ask you again but like a lot of the time we'll ask the, the question we will ask is what is your one day today? You know, what is it that, you know, what is it that you, I think how to position this question. You know, our, our, our tagline is one day is today. And, I, and one thing I've discovered, everyone has their own one day today. And like, what is it that you do today that you declare it's like you're that what is your one day today? What is it that you carry and that you embody in all that you do and all that you're who you're being and what you're up to? I get to I get to tell someone and invite someone every day. And and that really is part of my I, I feel like the one day concept, although I, I love the idea, I have an exercise I do with my team where we we write our perfect day, right? Of what what we're going to do in our future when we're achieving all those things. I feel like the one day actually is, is what I get to do every day, which is tell someone about the love of Jesus and invite them to learn about it themselves. And also tell someone about this world of entrepreneurship and invite them to learn more about it and how it can impact their lives. Because the thing is, I could pass away tomorrow and I know exactly where I'm going. And I, I'm very at peace about that. And I think to myself, whether you look at the Bible as a great book of history or the literal word of God, it is, it is a valuable book and something's real. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Something's real, right? Mm -hmm shouldn't that get to be part of each of our journey is, is really pursuing that? What is that? That is a very big question that I love to ask myself. 
Like, what is it? Because I feel you. There is something real in that text. That there's there's wisdom there. Um, and I, at the same time, I do feel like there's been a lot added to it and a lot taken out from what was originally there, um, in order to maybe push an agenda. It feels like it's to push an agenda. I don't really know, but it, it feels like it's particularly to push an agenda, like the editing that happened to those sacred texts. But the core of it, the truth of it, like it, I remember this moment. I was like 15 or 16. And I had been grounded for like bad grades. So like the only thing I was allowed to do was uh, go to school, come home, do my homework, and then go to my room and read. And that was, yeah, that was all I was allowed to do. And I was reading this book that absolutely changed my life. Um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I was laughing so hard. And it's it's such an irreverent book. Like it's, it's like it challenges religion and spirituality and everything. And, and I was just laughing my ass off reading this book. And out of nowhere, my mom comes bursting into my room. And she rips the book out of my hand. She goes, you're having too much fun. Here, read this. And she hands me a Bible. Oh. Whoa. Okay. So I'm not even going to bother pointing out that you consider <laughs> reading the Bible punishment. Like subconsciously, that's what you're telling me. I'm, not, I'm just going to ignore that part. Um, and I'm going to read the Bible. I'm, I'm just going to read it. And I, like, I'd already read it once. Um, and so I read it again, cover to cover. This was my second reading. And then I read it again, cover to cover. And then I read it a third time, cover to cover. And then I promptly became an atheist. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I, like, if that was the end of the story, it wouldn't be much of a story. It wouldn't be worth telling. Because then I moved to Hawaii. And I moved to Hawaii as an atheist, I, as like this, like um, a huge follower of the Three Horsemen of the Apocalypse, you know, Richard Dawkins and, and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens. And um, I was firmly in the camp of everything that exists in this world has a natural explanation. There is no need for supernatural ability or metaphysics or anything else. Like we can, we can explain everything strictly through science that what we can observe. That's it. And yet I come here and for two years, what I can only describe as magic is thrown in my face. Yeah. Like just over and over and over and over again to the point where I'm like, okay, I have to admit there's something else going on here that cannot be explained by science yet. Yeah. Yeah. Hawaii is one of those places that <laughs> as, as is Alaska where I'm from, I, I feel the same, same, same way. There's yeah. like being in nature and this, it's so beautiful. It, it's like your eyes hurt. It, it's just, there's, it's not possible. There's got to be something bigger, right? There's got to be something bigger. Like <laughs> and so, so I have come back to the Bible and uh, several other texts, like not just the Bible, but the Bhagavad Gita and the Dharma and a few others. And I'm looking at them with fresh eyes now. Yeah. And I'm rereading and like I'm, I'm listening to Jesus' words. I'm going, oh, this makes so much more sense now that I have this bigger context of experience. Um, and just you know, one, one small example um, would be to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, such a simple idea. And yet, growing up, we were never taught what it was meant to love yourself. Yeah. Like, what is that? Yeah. And now that I've had this experience of coming back to myself and learning really what it means to actually love myself, to accept myself as I am, and to to just honor that and know that even if I even if I don't necessarily like everything I am today, that I have the power to grow and change and shift and adapt. And I regardless of whether or not I like what I'm doing, I still love me. I accept me. And now to apply that to the neighbor and go, okay, well, I may not like everything they're doing, but I can, I can see them for what they are and I can love them. And what they are is this beautiful being who has no need to prove love to anyone. Like they don't need to prove that they deserve my love. They just, they are. And if I can approach them with that energy instead of this, I don't like what you're doing. You need to change. Yeah. It shifts everything. 
right so that's that's one of these beautiful truths that's in the bible that like i just i really love and there's so much of that my bible study we're doing a study in my bible study about all a lot of the major religions and i'm i'm teaching about islam mm. and imagine if all the major religions just decided to agree on the things that their faith agreed on because almost every major religion is about love yes you know imagine what a world that would be <laughs> imagine yeah. all the people <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you for sharing that matthew and it's you know it's i mean there's so many things i feel like i already see like three or four other episodes we could have of these conversations uh but you know it's, it's what struck me is like you know the, the, what jesus said is the most important commandment you know love the most two most important are love god with all your heart soul mind and might and to love your neighbor as yourself and yeah. i feel like <clears throat> society or individuals i should say have let that second one kind of be replaced with resent your neighbor like you resent yourself <laughs> and and i think it's knowing ourself outside of the indoctrination that you were talking about matthew it's knowing ourself as an infinite being beyond comprehensions of the mind beyond the comprehensions of all the labels and words we use to try to describe what is and it allows space for us to be and to see and to love our neighbor outside of the pressures and the the paradigm of i'm right and they're wrong and my god's right and your, your god's wrong it's you know it's like when we when we make it about how great and right we are and how right, bad and wrong everybody else is we've already lost we and our neighbor have lost because we're not even seeing ourselves like we're not even showing up to the equation in which we're equating any faith or you know and i believe any any faith or spiritual practice or teaching or even lack of just a moral comfort like it is misguided when we identify ourselves as these thoughts and fears and bodily sensations and emotions and you know the things that are temporary and that are are tempered that move with our what we're feeling that day and i had a bad day and girl i'm angry at that person and, oh i'm i hate that person you know i you know it's like i'm right and this is my opinion and they're right it's, it's that's the that's getting lost in the 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 i want to say the that's getting lost in knowledge in in, in our own head in our own mind in our own experience and i think like towards what matthew was saying it's like being skeptical like i had a similar story and i did i wasn't raised with any religious practice i mean my father's jewish but i didn't no one made me go to church it was my parents like you know you 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 can figure this out for yourself and you know so i was an outsider looking in it's like a lot of people have a lot of opinions about this Jesus guy and a lot of people have a lot of opinions about this and that, but I was always an outsider, but it was, but I was always like, you know, I was very rational and born in a secular world. So I was, I was skeptical, but it wasn't until I was skeptical of my own skepticism. And if I'm so sure about what I believe, if I'm so sure, you know, I can, I can question my own skepticism and say, I don't know. And from that place of, I don't know, that's where the wonder of, uh, and the experience of life happens. And that's where everything that, you know, the, the Bible's talking about is, are people describing the best way they can in human history of how to be when there's malevolence and fear in the world, when there's bad things that happen to, to good people, when there's tragedy, when there's trauma. And I think that's where every you know, major field, psychology, you know, philosophy, you know, religion, spirituality, theology, that's where they all meet is how do I be in this world to give, to bring myself less suffering and, and less suffering to my neighbor. And I think it, they all meet in the same point from that place of, you know, I get to say what I get to say the, what 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 my life is in service to i get to say what the, how i respond or react to this circumstance to this moment and i think it's from that place of 
not knowing and just being a little ant on a spinning rock in this infinite universe that we can actually show up and be like, we're all, we're all children of God. We're all divine in a divine expression of the universe. And our minds can't even comprehend our words can't even describe the totality of the infinite nature of who we are and standing there. That's when we get to play. That's when we get life is, is an experience. It is a discovery and it is a choice. And so that, that just came up, but it came out. I can't wait to, (laughs) I can't wait to continue to witness both of your journeys, your faith journeys. So I get to be part of that. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome. Thank, Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Absolutely. And we will have you back. Yes. Let's do it. You have to write down all those episodes that we're that we're gonna have. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so Lisa. Much. Thank you for being with us. And I'm gonna take a quick moment to check in. Bye, Lisa. I'm gonna take a quick moment to check in with our audience and just you know let you all know as a reminder, you know. We want you to be a guest on the stage. We want you to share what you've experienced, what gifts you have, what lessons and wisdom you have to share with us. So we want to invite you to be a sta- be a guest on this stage. You see the link there on the bottom of the screen. We'd love to have you and hold this space for you to share, you know, what 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 you've overcome and faced or what you're overcoming and facing right now that is allowing you to 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 really be focused on something greater than yourself. And that's that's part of what our mission is 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 bringing you and me and communities together in joyous celebration, unifying humanity in our diversity to create a better world for us all. And that's part of our vision here at One Day is humanity rising in a connected world with each person's unique gifts, unique genius, and unique contributions being valued and magnified through a higher level of collaboration, producing unprecedented new realms of possibility. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you again, Lisa, for being our guest today. We will see you not next week, but the week after. I love you all. Be safe, be well. And as always, one day is today. Peace, everybody.